start the recording. Thank you. Um, I am Dr. Sarah Baker and I serve on the USU faculty ETE committee. And our panel this afternoon is gonna explore relationships between uh, librarians and discipline faculty and how that can inform your pedagogy. Um, there is a lot of people involved actually, so I'm not gonna read their full bios, but I will paste the, uh, the directory, the, the, the link so that you could read about them directly. Um, but just to kind of introduce who is on which, which side of the teams, um, on the librarian side, we have Rachel Wyshkowski, Erin Davis, and Sandra Weingart. And on the faculty team, we have Avery Edenfield, Sarah Tulane, uh, Diana Meter, who is actually not able to uh, join us today, but she is still an active contributor. And finally, Amy Wilson Lopez. So I will paste that in there and they're gonna be watching the chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to post them there. Okay, go ahead. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. And hello, everyone. Thanks for making the time to attend our session today. Uh, my name is Rachel Wyshkowski. I'm a reference and instruction librarian here at USU. And um, thanks to Sarah for these introductions. Uh, as she said, our panel today is going to explore how research partnerships between librarians and faculty members in various disciplines at USU can inform pedagogy by providing instructors insight into their learner experiences, both on the librarian side and on the faculty side of things. Um, so our session today will center research in the scholarship of teaching and learning, which is really at the heart of evidence-based and inclusive teaching. And we'll share three examples um, from a range of disciplines and a range of research designs. In addition to talking about the details and highlighting some of the major findings of each of these projects, our panelists today will reflect on the collaborative process of designing, conducting, and sharing this research um, as teams. So we have a few questions today. I'm going to act um, as a moderator and we'll take these questions one by one. And we're going to have each team answer um, these prompts. So we'll kind of go one by one and we're going to begin um, with Avery and Erin, our OER team. So our first question is about pedagogy um, and the research process. So how did this research project emerge from your teaching? Give us the backstory about um, the project that you undertook together. Hey, thank you, Rachel. Um, so as, as Rachel already alluded, um, this was an involvement with Avery's um, Intro to Technical Communication course. And we already kind of had a long library involvement with that course. I used to be the English liaison librarian. And so I had already been um, helping in this in this particular intro to, to tech comm course when Avery was teaching it. And so uh, back in 2017 to 18, I was also heavily involved with our Open Educational Resources grant initiative, um, which we launched in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, for those of you who might remember. And Avery was one of the first people to also apply for that. Um, we had three different categories. There was adoption, adaption of OER materials, and then creation. And so he had, a, had applied for, um, for that very course I had already been involved with as his librarian. Um, um, he had applied for the adoption grant category. And so this really, that, that grant um, really encouraged instructor experimentation and innovation in finding new, better, and less costly ways to deliver our learning materials to students um, by using OER in the classroom. So again, replacing you know, a commercial textbook or more um, conventional one with something that's more open or open access. And really the idea for turning um, that into a small pilot study emerged from there. So the overall goal of our pilot project was to better understand the results of replacing that conventional textbook with OER, basically to see was there any noticeable difference or change in the grades in the class involvement, um, and also to have students, you know, it was really more of a perception study. So to have students self-report their perceptions and anticipated use of OER um, in terms of their reading and engagement with it and to learn more about maybe how their overall reading habits compared to their reading in other courses. And we'll talk more about results later. Thank you. So next we'll hear from the team that was doing a systematic review in engineering education. So Sandra and Amy. Thank you. I teach education courses to middle school and high school pre-service and in-service teachers. And um, based on many academic, dis academic disciplines, we know that it's important that teachers provide students with opportunities to be active learners who can produce knowledge within disciplines. 
Argumentation is a core strategy for teaching students to produce knowledge through making claims and justifying them. Um, and there have been a lot of reviews about argumentation in other academic disciplines, um, but not as much within engineering. So because I teach many engineering teachers, I wanted a better grasp of the literature on argumentation and engineering education um, to support me in being a better teacher educator, as well as to support my students in being better teachers. And, and Sandra was a wonderful partner in conducting a systematic review so that we could learn more about um, effective practices um, and supporting students' argumentation and engineering. Great, and then Sarah is going to introduce our last project, Human Development and Family Studies Research Methods. Sure, so I have been teaching uh, research, research methods for about six years online, and I've been heavily, heavily involved with librarians throughout the process from using OER materials to um, finding sometimes pain points that students face with some of the materials we're covering. And librarians have definitely developed some strong materials for my students. Um, for example, helping them to identify the correct type of article that they would be needing to use for specific assignments. One thing that Diana, Rachel, and I have noticed, and it's something that's pretty well recognized in the social sciences, is that research methods is a course that is, um, the students tend to lack interest in taking research methods courses. So this was something we wanted to investigate further, and we really wanted to inform our own teaching practices as well as help with others who teach this particular subject. Great, thank you, Sarah. And I should mention, um, Diana was unfortunately unable to be with us today, but Sarah is going to be sharing some of Diana's um, thoughts along the way as we discuss these different projects. So now that we have um, some basics of each of these three projects and their background, um, let's dig a little bit more into the design and implementation of the research component in each of these areas. What research methods did you use to assess the pedagogical aspects of your of um, your research question and how did the data collection and analysis processes go? Thanks, Rachel. Um, so we uh, surveyed four sections taught in the same year. Um, they were selected because they had a similar recently redesigned syllabus, similar student graphics and similar outcomes. Um, we did also designed and distributed two anonymous 10 question surveys to understand students' perceptions of the course's OER. Uh, we distributed the first survey in the first week of class when students were just being introduced to the, the OER, the, tech, the open access textbook. And we distributed the first survey within the first week. And then the, the surveys were designed for students to self-report their perceptions and anticipated use of OER. So how they thought they might begin to use it. And also to, um, kind of learn more about their overall reading habits, as, as Aaron has already said. Some of the questions that we, we included in that survey were, were whether or not they had previously used an, an OER, how they planned on accessing the course material, um, what if any of their concerns were about the material, and how much of the course reading they typically did in a semester, a typical semester, regardless of the textbook, and then if the cost of the textbook influenced their decision to take the course. And so we and then we distributed the second survey with similar questions to see if they reported a change in their perceptions. Um, importantly, the surveys were distributed by one of the authors of the study who is not um, an instructor of the course and did not have control over or access to student grades. And just a few other things to note. The instructor of record did not have access to the surveys until the end of the semester and after grades have been recorded. Um, and then we are aware that some students uh, completed one but did not the other. Um, based on attendance or maybe they dropped the course or they added later. Um, so some of the results showed that students uh, received the change favorably um, and a final grade comparison um, showed no variation um, between similar courses that use conventional textbooks um, and those that use open access books. So we didn't see a change in grades, um, but students did um, report favorable um, perception of the, of the change. Uh, and so while it is uh, far from definitive, um, we do recognize more studies are needed um, and that uh, it, we do believe that the study that we designed shows the promise of OER and implementation in, in the courses. Okay. That's us. Um, in our systematic review, we used the, um, the standard protocol of forming, crafting a research question 
um, selecting uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria, choosing a specific search strategy, screening the articles, um, extracting data, and then mapping the, the results. Um, the process went mostly well. We had a few stumbles here and there and learned a lot about uh, reference management software, but, um, but it went well. Great, thanks. For our data, what we did is we collected both qualitative and quantitative data at um, from students in three different sections of research methods. Two of those sections were face-to-face -face and one section was online. We had four points in time where we collected qualitative data and two points in time where we collected quantitative data. These were spaced um, throughout the semester. We had about 100 participants. We used some existing measures. One of them was the drama or disinterest, relevance, and argumentation scale. The other one was attitudes towards research scale. And so from these scales, we were specifically looking at relevance or how students perceive research as relevant, research disin disinterest, as well as attitudes towards research. Our qualitative questions, we had three of them. And they, the first one was asking students to define research for another student. The second was to describe the relationship between research terms such as theory, hypothesis testing, data collection, and analysis. And then finally, we asked them to describe what they used to think about research methods and what they currently think about research. Thank you. So a range of approaches there, including, as Avery mentioned, some of the challenges of collecting data from students, um, as well as there's challenges in, in other types of, of um, data collection. Even if you're doing a systematic review, there's all sorts of hoops to jump through. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about um, results. Uh, and particularly about sharing the results. Have you worked as a team to present or publish about this project and to what audiences? And I ask this to maybe give our participants today a sense of how librarians and faculty can work together to disseminate pedagogical findings. So for the OER team, um, we recently published an article in our journal on empowering teaching excellence um, that City does. And this was just published back in April of this year called Open Access Textbooks in a Professional Communication Classroom. Um, so we were excited to get that out. We also, I need to, to mention here that we co-authored that with um, Sharina Huntsman, who is now actually at Boise State University. At the time, she was a PhD student of Avery's um, and one of the instructors of that class. And so uh, it's really been nice that she's, now she's continuing to use OER um, in a similar classroom up at Boise, and she's you know, a big advocate for OER at her, at her campus. And so it's, it's nice to see that that work is continuing. Um, we also, because of one of Avery's contacts out of Boise, um, uh, Colorado Boise, we were participated back in February at this ethical ed tech event um, that, that kind of just started pretty recently. And so that was really, it was, really great just to kind of hear about other um, open access initiatives that are taking place across the nation. Um, so we got to talk about USU's approach to that and, um, and a little bit of Avery's perspective um, doing that in, the, in his classroom. And then, um, and, and I, the other thing I wanted to just mention was that, that, that our, our open access textbook um, paper that came out back in April, it's, it was nice to see. I, I just checked today, in fact, and it already has almost 60 downloads. And so it's, it's just great to get that work out there and um, to be continuing that, that advocacy for that initiative. Nice, and especially sharing it through ETE and USU Digital Commons channels too. That's great. Um, regarding our systematic review, we uh, had a poster and a paper accepted. Um, the poster was presented at the National Engineering Educators Conference in Salt Lake City in 2018, which was uh, very fortuitous because Amy's graduate students who contributed a great deal to this project were able to attend the conference and, and uh, do the poster presentation without having to dig up money for flights and accommodations and stuff. So um, that was a great opportunity for them. And then our full paper was published in the Journal of Engineering Education, which is the premier journal in that field. Congratulations. 
And in terms of our project, um, our, we're actually still in the process of data analysis. We're nearly finished with our qualitative analysis. Um, so we're preparing a manuscript, um, the three of us, as well as a uh, few graduate student assistants, um, which will probably be published in a, a library-oriented journal. Um, but I did present some preliminary results of our work at um, the Education, Behavioral, and Social Sciences sections virtual research forum that's part of um, ACRL or the Association of College and Research Libraries um, and had some librarians who were interested in both the faculty collaboration angle as well as the measures that we were using um, to assess uh, our students attitudes and, and kind of where they were at. All right. So with that background out of the way, um, we have time for a more detailed discussion about really the meat of this section, which is reflections on um, collaboration and how our research findings kind of translate back into the classroom and our teaching practices. Um, so let's take this question first. What are some of your takeaways about librarian and faculty collaboration on teaching related research? So from the OER side, um, it was really useful for me to see how OER adoption could go further than simply replacing one book with another. Um, I think in the past, I've really relied on you know, more anecdotal evidence, both from students and faculty that I've worked with. And um, the really cool thing about Avery's involvement was really from the beginning of the grant, he was interested in better understanding the results of you know, what, what this actually took to replace the conventional textbook with, a, with an open one. Um, and so, and for people that don't know, so these are often published under what, what we call a Creative Commons license. You might have seen that in the little C on, on different websites or different documents that you've perused. Um, and these, these materials are really increasingly being adopted into classrooms in response to different um, teaching and campus-wide initiatives, such as increasing reading in the classroom, which you've seen has been a really big focus of ours, increasing enrollment and retention, decreasing the overall time to graduation, and of course, the big one, always reducing costs for students. Um, for me, another really big takeaway from this experience has been um, we have a university-wide OER committee, and Avery joined that pretty pretty quickly after um, going through this this experience of, of doing the pilot and the paper and the study. So um, I've just been really impressed with Avery's commitment to open access, um, and for me, you know, it's it really is a social justice issue. So I think it's it's been great to to have that involvement. Um, thanks, Aaron. And uh, likewise, working with Aaron uh, and the library was just such a great experience for me. Um, one of the best things about it was that I didn't have to become an expert in the open access books. I could just rely on their expertise to, to kind of help figure out the materials that were needed. Um, and even with the, the pilot, the design of the pilot study, finding what are the appropriate methods and, and helping to kind of hone in the questions that were necessary to ask. Um, they, you know, Aaron was just a huge help with that, and I'm so grateful for that experience. Um, also, uh, one of the big challenges we had was how to talk to students about um, the OER, how to get how to get them to buy into it. And uh, you know, in that case, Aaron was just instrumental in helping to introduce it to students and introduce ways that they could use it and just the advantages of it. Um, just her expertise on that was and helping to, to, to sell it to students was, was really a huge help um, in that. Um, and uh, just, I find that, you know, long-term having this really good ongoing connection with the library and, and Aaron and the course is helpful because the course is often taught by TAs who um, are often new to teaching and uh, who also rotate, rotate out pretty regularly. And so it's really helpful to have that kind of ongoing connection um, and trying to, you know, hone in on the right strategies and and each one of these graduate students now are also becoming exposed to um, OER access and open access and OER textbooks. So they're taking that as Sharina did on with them when they graduate and starting their own initiatives at their universities. So um, I just thought it was overall just a, a wonderful collaboration. Very appreciative for that. Our project included collaborations between experts in argumentation and literacy education, a registered professional engineer, middle and high school teachers, and of course, Sandra, whose background provided us with the needed expertise on how to conduct systematic database searches. From this project, I learned the importance of holding regular conversations so that all people's expertise could be consulted at the right time in the project. 
I'm just so grateful to Amy for inviting me along on this project. Before I, I worked with her, I had given advice on systematic reviews um, previously, but I hadn't actually participated in one. So it was really great to see how my expertise filled a particular need in the project and also get to see how the rest of it was done. Um, it improved my skills enormously, which has enabled me to be more effective in helping subsequent reviews to be better. And it also um, gave me good insight on when I needed to step back and uh, let the PI do her stuff. Um, for me, there, this was just a really great collaborative process from idea generation all the way through data analysis. One particular part of the process that was great for me was working on a literature review with a librarian and learning her particular system um, and the way that she cataloged things, prepared things for writing. That was just really val valuable for me. Um, also, while doing the literature review from a personal pedagogical uh, position, I probably stopped more while reviewing articles than I ever have before working on a literature review because I was taking so much in of, oh, that's how people are addressing um, or teaching this particular topic. This is how it's working for other people. This is, there were just a lot of great ideas for how to teach research methods in that, in that literature review. Um, a couple of things that Diana pointed out is that this was a great opportunity for us to gain a shared understanding of research that exists on this topic our students and even our goals for where we could address student disengagement with this course. Another thing that Diana did point out is that it's pretty difficult to do research with your own students just due to issues of privacy and coercion. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add on to that because that's something that Diana and I worked on really extensively was making sure that we had, you know, we're doing a project in service of improving learning opportunities for students and we need to know what their perspectives are. And at the same time, we want to, you know, protect their privacy and not be coercive. Um, and so we needed to work pretty closely with the IRB in terms of our recruitment and our um, uh, anonymity and de-identification procedures um, to make that work. Um, from my perspective, uh, it was incredibly helpful to not only learn more about the students that I support in this course, but um, about the faculty who teach research methods, doing a research project with research methods faculty was really insightful for me in terms of learning some of their processes. I'm more of a qualitative researcher and I'm working with more quantitative researchers. So I definitely learned a lot um, in terms of uh, in, that, in that statistical analysis and um, data visualization process. Um, it was also really meaningful to involve undergrad and grad research assistants in some of the data analysis in this project. That was another fun opportunity for me to gain additional insights into students and how they learn in, um, in spaces outside our classrooms when we involve them in research. And then in terms of our findings themselves, two themes that have really emerged for me in the qualitative analysis have to do with um, students' own senses of themselves as researchers, so we're calling it researcher identity, and um, the importance of them seeing the relevance of research to their daily lives. So students feel demotivated when they see a major disconnect between who can and should do research. When they visualize, when they view it as something that's only done by people in white lab coats, it suddenly seems as something that's not for me, not attainable, I'm not interested. Um, and at the same time, if they see that research is doable and has relevance and application in daily life, both in personal decisions from buying a car, you know, to deciding what restaurant you're gonna eat at, to the professional decisions of how do I stay up to date when I'm a clinician in the future, um, th those points of connection really boost their sense of relevance um, and engagement and thus motivation in this course. And I think that that definitely has, um, implications for how we teach and what we emphasize. So speaking of that, um, let's talk about the broader impact of this type of work in our classrooms. How can we connect these research projects and projects like these to evidence-based and inclusive pedagogies? Sorry. Let's start with Avery, sorry, are you muted? Yeah, oh. yeah, I was, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so thanks, Rachel. Um, since we started using the OER in my Intro to TechCom class, which has now been rebranded as Workplace Writing, um, has required some retooling of curriculum and teaching styles. 
Um, but it's been fun to see how positively students um, have reacted to the text. It's been overwhelmingly positive to the point where we started to expand it to other, other courses. So, um, but it has this pilot enabled us to learn more about this house student learning. And we know that more research is needed now in this area. Um, so um, our experience with OER in the TechCom classroom also has motivated us to embrace innovative pedagogy. And so here are some examples. Um, we realize that using OER may allow for the integration of more content beyond textbooks, materials such as reading logs, interactive websites, and video tutorial, different kinds of multimedia. Um, so whereas in the past we found that, I found that uh, asking students to purchase an expensive textbook often felt com committed the rest of the course to that textbook, but without that commitment, um, of an expensive textbook, we're able to have a lot more flexibility in what we bring in. Um, and we do continue to plan taking advantage of the flexibility to adapt different kinds of course materials in the future as student needs change. Um, and embracing this dynamic nature of OER and open access tests may lead to an overall a more student-centered classroom. Um, and, and we can also continue to access and evaluate course materials alongside our students and this kind of ongoing dialogue. Um, and as we continue to use OER, we anticipate building a growing uh, repository of resources from which we can pull from as these new TAs continue to take onto the course, finding more materials, finding videos that they use. It just winds up kind of stockpiling resources that we can kind of pull from each semester. Um, but there are still some questions that we're continuing to explore, like uh, will the use of OER in these classes significantly impact time to graduation rates, um, especially as we ex expand it throughout the major? Um, will the adoption of an OER lead to an increase in enrollment in our major? And as we continue to adopt adopting OER in the future, um, we do hope to continue to maintain these, uh, conduct more studies to find out, get a little bit more evidence about to help us address these questions. All right. Um, well, a systematic review is um, one of the tools for um, evidence-based practice. It, we help summarize the evidence and, and really evaluate what the, what the knowledge on a particular topic is. So, um, so that contributes to, um, to evidence-based practice in itself. And then once we have an idea of what actually works and, and what doesn't work, then Amy can uh, take that into her classroom, training both pre-service and in-service teachers um, to, to use in their K-12 classroom. And um, in particular, because the designed world is all around us, so the, the products of technologies, helping students make and justify claims related to them um, is, I think, um, empowering helps people be um, better citizens. Um, so, for example, examples we saw um, commonly was um, whether or not genetically modified organisms um, should be used or in what cases they should be used. So those, that pe people making claims related to that. And so effective um, instructional practices related to those claims include, you know, presenting um, data from multiple perspectives. So maybe from an environmental perspective, economic perspective, um, health perspective, and then um, having students consider multiple different factors as they um, make and validate claims related to, you know, technologies. And so those are some ways that I hope to be a better teacher of teachers and then hopefully and um, the teachers can also incorporate those practices into their own classroom teaching as well. So for our project, uh, one of the major things that impacts the way that we approach the, the class is recognizing that students are entering research methods with pretty varied backgrounds. So you have some students who are coming in that are fresh from completing a statistics course and others who it may have been nine or 10 years since they've completed a statistics course. Um, some are enter entering, as Diana pointed out, that some just have varying levels of interest and perceptions as far as relevance of research when they're just entering the course. Furthermore, when they're progressing through the course, there's not one pathway that students follow. That was something we definitely learned from our data, is some fall in love with the class and others just wind up hating it over time. Um, so keeping these things in mind, it really helps us to think about how we can address the interest 
and relevance even before they get into the course. Both Diana and I agree that um, exposing to exposure to research methods in other major coursework can help us to, to design even a better course to address interest and help facilitate learning. Um, we think that more exposure to research can definitely help in, in the scholarship of teaching with this particular subject. Great, and I think um, for me, it's, it, this project really drove home the, the point that I need to be aware of, of what students are encountering prior to hitting this course in the curriculum. Um, so we already do curriculum mapping as librarians, but making sure that I'm revisiting that so that I really understand um, what exposure, what opportunities, um, perhaps what anxieties, what you know, conf areas of confidence students have before they hit the class um, and work with uh, instructors in the prerequisite courses as much as I'm working with instructors of research methods courses to make sure that are set up from an information literacy and library perspective um, to really dive into content when they, when they hit um, research methods. All right. Well, it's a miracle, but we have plenty of time, I believe, <laughs> for questions. And we have reached the end of our kind of prepared remarks. I know we have Day, but if there's any questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat. Sarah, if you have any, or if any panelists have questions for each other, anything and everything as well. I do see some congratulations, Avery and Aaron, on their success with OER from Sam. I actually do have a question about OER as well. Um, there are a lot of OER resources in my field, um, but I often have not wanted to use them in part because they don't have a common voice, which is I, I think one of the strengths of using a traditional textbook that one person or maybe a team of people over time have gathered these materials and they're presented with the same terminology, uh, you know, the same kinds of format, it's maybe easier for students. And I just wonder, um, maybe from a SOTL perspective, and I think probably any of you could answer this, um, what the kind of benefits of, of that are, or whether it's actually just kind of a fiction that we think that it's better because it's easier when in fact, it's better to be more engaged and encountering different terminology and, and fighting with that from the very beginning. Um, I, I, I understand what you mean. I think that's something that we struggled with a little bit. Um, but, you know, I think, I think it is good for students to kind of settle into that contestation early. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I just, for me, I, the, the having that kind of one voice throughout was not necessarily an advantage. Um, because I found so many of the textbooks um, were because of their cost and um, kind of that normative voice, it kind of excluded other pers perspectives in a lot in a big way. And the co the cost of the book was so prohibitive that I don't think we just gained we didn't really gain anything by keeping it other than that. Um, because I still pull from books. You know, um, just like small sections. If I find that this one textbook, say, really deals with audience in a way that I really like, well, I could, you know, I've worked with the library to be able to get to use that section, um, or some examples, or some some of the exercises at the end. I still use a lot of them. I still have all this rack of books in my office that I draw from pretty regularly, and I give them out to grad students when I can too. And but. Um, I, I understand what you mean, but I think it does kind of help like more towards knowledge production to have them kind of, yeah, deal with those contestations early. That's just my, my view. I don't know if Aaron, if you wanted to speak to that. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think it's an excellent question. I, I love what Avery said and added to it. Um, adding to that, I did post in the chat our, um, our OER website, and I think it really, I think so much of it depends on two things, your discipline. So, you know, Sarah, for you coming from music, there's just, you know, there really are a lack of OER, and that's where we need more of those creation projects. 
Um, so I'm always putting in the plug for <laughs> any type of um, grant incentive program, of course, shameless plug. Um, and I think it also really, there are many flavors to it, just like there, you know, there's, a, there's not a great, there, you know, it's good and bad in terms of the commercial textbooks that are out there. Um, it's the same thing in terms of the quality of, you know, the OER that are out there. And so I would say that um, the site that I, out of that OER website, I gave you the, the find OER link. And this is just really the tip of the iceberg. Um, Open Textbook Library is great. It's a, it's a really good repository. It's out of University of Minnesota. Um, and the, the cool thing here is that it's, it's more of like an Amazon type of style review where you can actually have, um, as you're looking through the reviews, it's not, it's not peer reviewed, but you can at least see different faculty members throughout the world that have, you know, actually used these different resources and they put their, um, you know, they, they have their reviews in there. Um, their evaluations of the books. And so I think that's been really nice to have. I also think that it doesn't have to be, I think the, the great thing about OER is just the flexibility, as I think Avery mentioned before, that it's not like you just have to go with, you know, in the world of OER, in the world of commercial textbooks, the way we've always kind of done it is, and sure, it's easier, I think, as faculty, but, you know, committing to that one book, whereas with OER, it gives you that flexibility that you can really um, you know, do it piecemeal. So you can say, okay, for these chapters or for these concepts, I'm really relying on, you know, the standard textbook that I've kind of, you know, that I've always used before. Um, and then for other things where you're, you don't think your commercial textbook does a great job in covering those issues, that's where you can really bring in those other voices or this other, you know, and that's where it's, it can be the world open, it opens up in terms of, it doesn't just have to be one of these OER, it can be a library ebook, e, um, ebook that we have, you know, that we, our students are already paying for. And if, if you next session, <laughs> I'm, I'm presenting again at 3.30 with Shannon Smith, who's in our OER, um, she's out of Digital Initiatives and she's our Digital Scholarship Librarian. Um, we talk more about open pedagogy, which is really where you start to get your students, you know, you get, get away from that disposable assignment and, and really get students to start generating some of this work for you, where, you know, you can re refer to it in future semesters. Easier said than done, of course. I don't have, I'm not teaching my own class. Um, Aaron's point about library licensed materials is something I just wanted to pull out that um, there are things that have been produced through the process that that you're familiar with, you know, peer review and all that, that are available to the students to use through licenses that have already been paid for. So definitely check with your liaison librarian about that too. I think there's also some potentially really fun opportunities for leaning into kind of canon busting and finding and digging into conversations uh, that are happening within the discipline about, about particular things, you know, comparing representation and, and coverage uh, across OER, you know, traditional materials and other library licensed materials could be really interesting and, and a productive learning opportunity for students rather than having you as the instructor have to write that common voice and through line having students actually engage with that process. Um, be really uh, other comments, other questions? Thank you for asking that one, Sarah. <laughs> I, I had a, qu a quick question. Um, I feel like we're focusing too much on OER, but it's, I'm so passionate about it and I'm grateful that this is- no, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> this is happening. I, I was just looking over and then I realized you are presenting three different studies and I sort of honed in on the OER. Um, but for me, it's very personal. I, the notion that we could make higher education more accessible to more people, um, it may not mean as much in this part of the world, but I think of other parts of the world where that is just unthinkable. It's like a dream come true. Mm -hmm. So my question to all of you, um, and I'm excited you're work, working with the work with every on this, but I dream of a world where there are more people. Um, I know it was a, a key question for me before joining Utah State was, what does the university do about open educational resources. And I was shocked that 
this university have actually played a, a key role from, from the beginning. So how do we get more people excited about OER from your perspective? Um, I dream of a world where there are more faculty involved with the library. So we are kind of maintaining that leadership position or leading it. I don't know if we've slowed down over the years or if it's getting, enthusiasm is getting higher or lower, but I like to see this university do a lot more. What will it take? Like, what could I do that I'm not doing now? What could everybody do if you were to, if you had the attention of all the faculty and you could ask anything? Sam, I'll, I'll just jump in really quickly. I don't want to dominate the conversation, but you I love should. your enthusiasm. You <laughs> I love your enthusiasm. It's you bring up so many great points, and I, I feel the same way about it. Um, honestly, I, I think people should start small and sub out one reading, one course reading in their class, and just try it. See how it works. Um, <clears throat> I think for a lot of people, they think that you know it has to be you know this huge time commitment um, that they have to you know totally dismantle everything, all their powerpoints and all of their ancillary materials. And I really think that if people just um, and I think actually a lot of a lot of faculty and instructors I've worked with are already doing this. They just don't even realize that it's a thing. Um, I think especially right now in this COVID world, where we have a lot of students that you know um, are waiting for that that second stimulus you know paycheck. Um, maybe they're taking a gap year or they're considering it. You know, this is the time more than ever to jump in. Um, that's why the library has done. We've we've uh, gotten together with. Uh, Robert Wagner's group out of um, uh, City and they have a their um, I'm sorry, I forgot it's academic instructional services, the AIS group, and um, along with IT, central IT, the three of the, the three of us have all gotten together and we have grant incentive programs to help faculty who really want to for you know take it to that next level. But I really think that even just starting small would be great, getting students involved. Um, and we also have a campus wide um, a university-wide uh, open, education, uh, open educational resources committee that we would love it if you joined it. <laughs> yeah. um, I think it's also important um, for faculty to note that they don't have to do it all by themselves. They don't have to figure it out alone. Um, every department has a liaison library and you can look on the library website to see who yours is. Um, so contact that person and we will be more than happy um, to help you get started. Um, Avery mentioned um, training his graduate students um, in, in these techniques, and then they go out to other universities, which um, get them while they're young, before, before they're um, faculty members themselves, I think. If they're used to it as students, they'll be much more likely to go out and do it. The other thing um, for all faculty members, one of the ways to um, make resources more available yourself as a producer of information is to um, send us your, your CV and we will, to the extent possible, post your stuff in the institutional repository, which opens it up to the world. If you're not sure what rights you have um, for the, contact, uh, the contracts you signed with your publisher, uh, we have somebody to help with that too. So, um, so both as an instructor using open materials and as a producer of, of knowledge, um, your own research, um, put that out there. Thank you, Sandra. And I saw Avery had one more comment. So maybe we'll end with that or a resource. Oh, I, I was mentioning about the ethical ed tech, uh, Sam, that might be another place to, to start and check out. I was gonna mention the the um, the advisory board, uh, but that's already mentioned. I think it's a great way to get involved institutionally. But Ethical Ed Tech is is a great repository of open access technologies. Um, many of them can take the place of proprietary, expensive technologies, and I think they just don't have as much of a presence. Um, so I think any kind of using replacing um, expensive proprietary technology like like Zoom with something that's open access like Jitsi there are small ways to, to expose students to that. And I think that is part of like one of, the, one of the problems with graduate school we know is like you replicate what you have in your, what you've been exposed to, right? We, we cite the same scholars that we learned about in graduate school. We do some of the same research that we, you know, 
it, it becomes a like part of what we replicate when we go out into the world. So I think that that's part of why it's so important to expose students and, and grad students to this stuff now. So it becomes part of their repertoire when they go out. Thanks. On that note, I'd like you to all unmute your, uh, yourselves right now and let's uh, thank all of our speakers. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. Thank you, uh, the ch in the chat, I also left the link to go back to the rest of the conference. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.